Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, moving right along. Paul is talking about this amazing word, grace. Everybody say grace. We've been reading this passage for the whole summer. We're going to read it continually through the summer. It is what we like to call summer of grace. Hashtag it. Send it to your friends with an Instagram. Summer of grace. Or you could just hashtag it's all about that grace. Or just hashtag grace. And this passage is so amazing, but I'm going to ask you guys right now who have read it with me time and time again, who have heard it before, I want you to pretend right now you're reading it for the first time, for the very first time, and let this impact you, and let's see what we get out of it. For it is by grace you have been saved. Everybody say saved. Thank you. Through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. See what comes to your mind when you hear that? It is the gift of God. I think of a gift, right? Not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. When I think about this afresh, and I really wanted that to be in my heart this week, I thought about what was going on in our culture. Now, of course, everybody's talking about Bruce Jenner now becoming Caitlyn Jenner, and it's a big deal. I don't know if it's going on at your job, if it's happening at the water cooler in different places or at your family hangouts, but this was something that I thought of. Bruce Jenner was born a man. His chromosomes are that of a man, but yet he identifies with a woman, and so he changed his body to be like a woman, though he's still a man, and he dresses like a woman, so he's make-believing, pretending. Everybody say pretending. He is pretending to be something he is not. That's a strange thing to do, especially for an adult. This is a time that we live in where people are pretending to be things that they're not. Now watch this. People then applaud him and say, we love your make-believe. We love it. You're playing make-believe. You're so good at it. Now imagine if I said I was Captain Hook, and I came here with a little hook on my arm and a patch over my eye. And would you applaud me for pretending to be Captain Hook today? No, but our culture is going towards a place of perversion. And it's perverting the version. Version is in the word perversion. It's turning and changing the version. So we live in a time when people are applauding make-believe. Now watch this. Look how this passage applies to this. And yet, at the same time, there are Christians here who God has said, you are saved. You are a new creation. You are my handiwork. You are my masterpiece. That's what that word in the Greek means, masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And yet there are Christians here pretending that they can't do good works. That they can't stop sinning. That they can't stop doing the bad. Both people are playing make-believe. This is how I said it before in Facebook, and I want you to write this down if you can. Sinners are pretending to be saints. And saints are pretending to be sinners. Let that sink in. We live in a time where people are being applauded for being something that they're not. And then now the church is acting the same way. Many people here, if I said to you, are you God's masterpiece? Are you created to do good works? You would say, no, I'm just a sinner like everybody else. Nobody's perfect. And then you would expect me to applaud you and go, well, that's so awesome. But that's pretending to be something you're not. You're not to pretend like you are a sinner anymore. You're to know who you really are. Yes. Bruce Jenner is really a man, and we should celebrate him being a man, not pretending to be a woman. And we shouldn't come to church just coming to get more forgiveness so we can go out and sin because we're pretending to be Christians, but we're really acting like sinners. Sinners are pretending to be saints, and everybody thinks they're cool and doing the right thing and saints are pretending to be sinners it's time for saints to start believing they're saints it's not make believe for me to look at every one of you who has called on Jesus and for me to say you're saved that's not make believe that's not pretending that's the truth that means you're saved from something 
If you are saved, what are you saved from? If, if, if I came running up into your house, broke down the door, like I say, I got into your house, broke down the door, oh my gosh, and I huffing and puffing, and then I go, now I'm safe, now I'm safe, what would you say to me? Well, who was chasing you? What was going wrong? What are you now safe from? How, how did this, you coming into my house, change your situation? Are you guys with me? If we as Christians say we're saved, what are we saved from? What, what has changed? I'm saved from my sins. I am saved from my old way of living. Now, think about this, saints. Think about this, saved folks. Wouldn't it be awesome and like really rad if there was a whole chapter in the Bible that just taught you about knowing that you're not a sinner anymore in Christ and you're a saint? Wouldn't that be awesome? Do you think I know of a chapter like that? Let's turn to Romans chapter 6. Sinners are pretending to be saints. Look at me. I got it all together. I'm doing the right thing. And it's like, no, you're not. And then saints who are in church who are supposed to be the right thing are saying, no, I'm just messed up. Why are we playing make-believe? We shouldn't be identifying with our sin. We should be identifying with Jesus. Look at the, ta the title of this chapter right here. Dead to sin, alive to what? Dead to sin and alive to... I guess we are starting to fill the side section. Let's give it up for my wife and Pastor Griselda filling it up. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Should saints and Christians keep on sinning because now they've found the golden ticket? Now they've got Willy Wonka's chocolate factory of grace and they can have all they want? Now they've found the leprechaun's pot of gold. And I can't do an Irish accent, but that's my best. Is it, is it that all that Christianity is? I'm just a sinner who keeps on sinning. But the difference between me and all the other sinners is I know where to get clean so I can keep sinning some more. I know where the grace is. I can double up on some grace today. Is that the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? Is the we just know where the grace is so we can keep on sinning? Look at what the Bible says. Shall we keep on sinning? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? If you are born again, again, born again, that means you are dead to the life you were living. If you have a second life in you, the first life don't count no more. Is anybody here born again? So what happened to your old life? What is it? It is dead. Everybody say dead. dead. Where is that word? You have died to sin. Or do you not know? Do some of the church members here and across our country or around the world, or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death, therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in the what kind of life? The old life? That old life of sin? See, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of works. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. For you are God's handiwork, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you believe that? Put that up. Come on, do you believe it? See, that's what sticks out to me. Every week I'm trying to bring a new nugget of this passage to you as we go through our sermon series. Look at your neighbor and say, that was just the introduction. Amen. We've been studying grace. Our notes are always found online in the form of blogs. You can see them right now on your phone, mpichurch.org, and you'll see the sermon. mpichurch.org, and we're talking about the throne of grace part two. Three wonderful definitions of grace to help you understand it, but I want to em emphasize this one today. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. 
How do we receive this forgiveness? How do we receive this new life? As Romans just told us, we receive it because Christ died for us and raised again from the dead. And let me just emphasize this, please. As real as a historical event as President Obama getting inaugurated into the office of the President of the United States, as historic as that was, there was people there, it was done in a real place and matter, it was with matter, space and time. As real as that was, there was a man named Jesus who lived a sinless life 2,000 years ago, was crucified by the Roman government because of the Jewish betrayal of his own people. He was called a blasphemer. He was then killed on that cross, speared through with a, thrust through with a spear, and bled out so that everyone would see that he has died. He didn't just pass out. They speared him through his organs and his heart. Blood and water came out. Those of you who know your biology, blood and water came out from his heart and his organs. They took him down and buried him in a specific tomb. They just tossed him somewhere. He didn't just disappear. They buried him in the tomb of Joseph from the city of Arimathea. And there he was buried. And on the third day, the women that were his followers went to do burial rituals to bring spices and things to his body to honor him. And there they met angels that told him Jesus was no longer there but had raised from the dead. Then for the next couple of weeks, Jesus appears to them appears to Peter, his disciple, who had previously betrayed him. He appears to Thomas, who says, I don't believe you. I believe the disciples who said they had already seen him. They, he said, I won't believe until I touch his nail-pierced hands and put my hands in his side. These disciples saw him then ascend to heaven on a cloud as they were watching him ascend. Angels came and spoke to them and said, as he has gone... He will come back. And now the church has been here for 2,000 years waiting for his return. Everybody say, real deal. That is the historical event that happened. Just like Martin Luther King did his march in Selma. Just like President Obama was inaugurated as president. Just as surely as whatever you did yesterday happened. That event happened. Now, there is a reason why that event happened. It is so that you and I might be saved. That event of Jesus dying on the cross goes back to an Old Testament pattern of blood being shed for forgiveness. In the Old Testament, those first 39 books of your Bible, God speaks to the man called Moses and gives Moses a pattern to do to have God be pleased with the people of Israelite, the Israelites who were from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham was the father of the nation, then, Jacob, uh, then Isaac his son, then Jacob, and Jacob had tribes, and these people became known as the Israelites, and God speaks to Moses on a mountain. How many have ever heard of the Ten Commandments? That's only 10 out of 610. That's why you have the book called Leviticus. These were most of where these 600 rules were written. These laws were based upon a temple. Put up the Old Testament, uh, put up the tabernacle of Moses, please. In the tabernacle, there were three parts. There was a part where you would sacrifice for animals and where priests would wash themselves after they sacrificed animals because it would be a bloody mess. Has anybody ever seen the slaughter of a cow before? Have you ever watched that? Have you ever been on a farm? Some of you think I'm crazy. This is how you get this, the hamburger you're going to eat today, okay? They slaughter animals to get meat. The priests would slaughter animals. Then they would wash themselves. That was in the first part of the temple. Then the second part of the temple, they would light candles called the menorah. There would be there these candlesticks that they would light, seven of them. Thank you, sir. Point on this one right here, that one. Click on it, please, that one. Boom, right there. They would sacrifice the animals. This is what, part of what God told Moses. You can just chill right there. Thank you, sir. Right here is they would kill the animals. Look, dude about ready to kill a cow. That's what's happening right here. They then would set that thing on fire, and God says, I love the smell of that. Has anybody ever been to Fogo de Chao? Have you ever walked in there and just smelt the aroma of meat cooking? Your God likes that. As I said before, your God is not a yoga pant-wearing vegetarian. He is a meat-eating kind of God. Amen? 
And here's where they would wash themselves. Then they would go to this second part right here. And in this part, they would do some rituals. And then there would be a veil going into the last and third part. And that last and third part would have what we call the Ark of the Covenant. If you could put that back up there for me, please. This Ark of the Covenant goes beyond just Indiana Jones in a movie you might have seen about it. This Ark of the Covenant symbolized death for forgiveness. Blood being shed for forgiveness. This Ark of the Covenant was called an Ark because it could be carried and transported. It had two angels here, and in the middle, this was considered a mercy seat representing the throne of God. Everybody say the throne of God. If you took off this lid, you would find three things in this ark. Number one, the Ten Commandments that God wrote with his own hand. Number two, the staff of Aaron, Moses' brother, that budded miraculously to show the people he would be the chief priest of the Jewish religion. And then thirdly, a jar of manna to remind the people of where God, uh, what God did to feed them while they were in the desert for 40 years. Are you guys with me? This place right here, they would visit and put the blood of the animal they had sacrificed and sprinkle it all on the top here. What that was symbolizing was God's mercy. The people of Israel would sin, an animal would die, a priest would sprinkle blood on this Ark of the Covenant. This Ark of the Covenant was to represent a picture of heaven. When we sin, things die. If we don't have God's mercy, we will be the ones who die. Go to Romans, please. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Whoever has memorized it, shout it out if you know it. Amen. Thank you. Let's give it up for Pastor Jared knowing his Bible. Amen. We learn the lesson here for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The Bible says that you have been saved by grace. And this is not of yourselves. This is the gift of God. Do you guys remember reading that in Ephesians? This passage tells us why we need to be saved. We need to be saved from our sins. Sins equal death. Death. Ask yourself this question. How much more sin do you want in your life? you got to be honest with yourself. How much more do you want? If you don't know what sin is, let me just give you a quick list. Galatians chapter 5, 20, 19 to 21 has a quick list of sin. Sexual immorality, bitterness, anger, fits of rage, drunkenness, idolatry, witchcraft, factions, dissensions. You know, these are a basic list of sins. Obviously, we know the other ones in the Ten Commandments, lying, stealing, blasphemy, taking the Lord's name in vain, coveting what your neighbor has. So ask yourself this question, how much more sin do I want? Because if you're not being honest with yourself, you're only playing make-believe. I want to be honest with you and tell you, I don't want any more sin. Now that may not always be what I do. I may sin and I may need to be forgiven, but that's not who I am. Because Jesus has given me eternal life. Jesus has given me a gift. And this is what I want to live for. I don't want death anymore. Can I hear an amen? amen? Okay, let's go to our notes. Everybody say, let's get to the message. Let's get to the message now. I want you to see today what God is saying to us in Hebrews. Open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 is an, an amazing book, a tremendous book. It is the book in the New Testament that summarizes why everything was there in the Old Testament. If you want to know why there were sacrifices in the Old Testament, read the book of Hebrews. If you, in the New Testament, it's a New Testament book. Old Testament means old way of doing things. New Testament means new way of doing things. New deal. If you want to know why there were priests in the Old Testament, read the book of Hebrews. If you want to know why God gave 610 commands, read the book of Hebrews. If you want to know why there was a place called a mercy seat, this place right here, the Ark of the Covenant, this place right here where the angels put their wings right here in the middle was called the mercy seat. Everybody say mercy seat. If you want to know why that's there, you go to the book of Hebrews as well. And this is where we get to today's message. Everybody say the throne of grace. 
You see, that mercy seat there at the Ark of the Covenant was representing to the Israelite people a real place in heaven where angels were, where God was seated, and where His Son, the Lamb, was slain for our sins. That's the real picture of what the Ark of the Covenant was showing us. Look at this passage. If you're in Hebrews 4, verse 14, somebody say, I'm there. Awesome. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. So now in the New Testament, who is our high priest? And Jesus is who? The Son of God. And what did he do? He what? Ascended into heaven. Earthly priests would walk through a temple and sprinkle blood on, a cov- on a, uh, an Ark of the Covenant. Are you with me? Jesus, the high priest, ascends into heaven as the Son of God. That's the real deal. The example is men walking around sprinkling blood of an animal. That's a shadow. Everybody say a shadow. Look at this. You see, on my table here, I have a shadow of my rag. The rag is here. The shadow is here. Okay, let's make a better example. Watch right here. A wallet with a credit card. How many can use some money? We're hooking up Juan with some money. How many can use some money? Make some noise. Amen. Y'all don't, the rest of y'all don't want money. That's okay. Give it to the church then. Amen. It's not spiritual to want money. Just don't love it. Put it. Don't put anything before God, all right? Watch. Here's the credit card, right? Let's say this was an American Express, Express black credit card. They do exist with no limit, no limit. They give it to a certain amount of people that can back it up, right? So you could buy something of a million dollars on that credit card. Let's pretend this is it. What would you rather have, the credit card or the shadow of the credit card? This is a hard question. You've got to be up this morning to get it. You've got to be paying attention. You've got to at least be up to get this one. Would you want the credit card or the shadow of the credit card? For the sake of an example, Jason, would you please try to take the shadow of the credit card and put it in your pocket? Can you get it? No, you cannot have it. It's only a shadow. This of the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, is the shadow of Jesus in the cross. This is not what saved. The Jewish people were not saved because of this. They were saved because there was the real deal, the shadow of Jesus in heaven setting the stage to appear at the right time. The Bible says, go to Hebrews chapter 1. The Bible says at the right time God spoke through His Son the final message. Hebrews chapter 1, before we get to Hebrews 6, let's go to Hebrews uh, 1, amen? Before we get to anything, let's look at the beginning of this book and see how it started. See, Hebrews explains to you why the Jewish people were doing what they were doing. Hebrews chapter 1, please. What would you rather have, a shadow of your husband or your husband? A shadow of a car or the car itself? Look at this right here, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and onward, look at it. Here is the passage. We're still in the New uh, New King James. Let me get to the NIV. Sorry, this was for our study time earlier. Look at this here. In times past, God spoke to our ancestors, talking about the Jewish people, through prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom is appointed heir of all things, and through whom also He made the universe. When Jesus came down in a manger, that wasn't when he was born. He had already existed. He made the universe, friends. He just came in an earthly body to show the reality of the shadows. He was coming from heaven to earth. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Come on. Oh, no. Keep it right here. We don't got time. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. And the what kind of representation of God's being? The exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After He had provided purifications for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. But the reality was in heaven. Jesus comes from heaven and says, Here I am. The fulfillment of everything you've been doing. 
That's why he died on the cross to shed his blood so that the reality of God's grace might be given to us. Everybody say the throne of grace. That's what that was representing was the cross. If I could put them side by side, it would be one would be that Ark of the Covenant. The other one would be Jesus on the cross. One was the shadow. One was the reality. What do you want? More religion or do you want Jesus? Do you want me uh, to dress up in a robe? You call me father and me feed you num-nums out of my hand like a baby pigeon? Is that what you want? Do you want more religion or do you want Jesus? What do you want, Jesus or religion? Jesus. Amen. Praise God. I'm happy for Jesus. I'm happy I can come to church in shorts this morning. Amen. I'm happy that the only one who calls me father are my children. Amen. If you want, you can call me poppy though. Just if you want. If you want. Let it be on you. You decide. You decide. (laughs) Poppy. No, I'm kidding. We're not doing that. Okay. Anywho. Hebrews 4, 14 and onward. Therefore, since we have a great high priest. Remember, Hebrews chapter 1 starts us off talking about what he did. The, the thought continues. Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, but he had come from heaven first, right? He came from heaven and then he ascended back to heaven. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize. Oh, Lord, help me empathize yes thank you jesus those of you who were not here last week you were spared me trying to pronounce this word empathize it went for a long time and it was getting quite awkward and people were definitely feeling sorry for me and now you know why you have to pray for me as i go to school tomorrow right empathize empathize and they're like looking at me like what's wrong with you you're in a doctoral class sir pronounce the word or you have to leave i try so hard <laughs> I think it's just God's way of humbling me. You know, he's like, you think you're cool up there? Let me just stutter your tongue a little bit. Let me just do that to you. No, I'm kidding. That was all me. For, you, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. So did Jesus sin? But was he tempted in every way like us? Okay, write down some of your temptations. Write it on your phone. Write it on the back of the the announcements. You got notes there? Write them down, even the dark and dirty ones, the ones that you don't want anybody to know about. Sadly, there have been people tempted to murder. Sadly, there have been people tempted to hurt children, tempted to lie. Do you know that when Jesus was here, he was tempted more than just those three times by the devil? He was constantly having the devil throw at him every temptation. The temptation of suicide, the temptation of homosexuality, the temptation of having an orgy, the temptation of being bitter, the temptation of mass murder, the temptation of witchcraft, the temptation of idolatry. The Bible is very clear that we have a high priest who was a, is able to empathize with us because he was tempted in every way just as we are. There is no sin that Jesus, uh, there is not a sin that Jesus did not take on the cross. All of the Holocaust that Hitler did was still on that cross. It was there. It was not missing. Every wickedness of mankind from my daughter arguing over a toy and sinning because she was jealous to the Holocaust, Christ took it all. And to what sin tempts us to do, from jealousy of a three-year-old, four-year-old, whatever, to a mass murderer, Jesus was tempted with it all. But here's the encouragement. He did not sin. Now, at this point, we just want to be like, Hercule, Jesus, Jesus. He didn't sin. He didn't. He's so awesome. Nobody's perfect but Jesus. Nobody ever not sins but Jesus. And that is so true. That's, that's right. No one has not sinned except Jesus, period. Nothing else to say. True. But there's another part of this verse that says, let us approach God's what? Throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So yes, nobody has ever gone without sin except Jesus, but the one who went without sin and has been tempted in every way, he's saying, you can come to me for help, and I'll help you not to sin. I'll help 
you to do what I did. Everybody go to 1 John 4, 17. 1 John 4, 17, crispy and clean. Know what I mean. You like 1 John 4, 17? Are you crispy and clean? Do you know what I mean? Do you want some grace up in your face? How about up in this place? <laughs> He's not deciding if he likes me yet or not. I like you. You're a cool guy. I'm trying to be cool with my gente. Here we go. 1 John 4, 17. Everybody go bring it. Look at what it says right here. 1 John 4, 17. This is how love is made complete in us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like, we are like Kanye West. We are like Caitlyn Jenner. We are like whoever else is messed up in this world. We are like our mama and dada, our, our nana and papa. We are like Jesus. We are like Jesus. Jesus. That's who I'm supposed to be like. Well, I don't know how to be like him because I'm so messed up. Well, go to him for help. If you want to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger, go ask him for help. Let him train you. You want to be like Brock Lesnar, go to Brock Lesnar. Let him train you. You want to be like uh, America's Next Top Model, ladies? No, I didn't get no love. No love. You want to be like Oprah? Go ask Oprah. Whoever ladies like, whoever's ladies, what is your hero? Who is a woman hero to you? Oprah? Is she a woman hero? Let's keep it real. She's about the best we can come up with right now. Okay. But in this world, we are to be like Jesus. You are expected in this world to be like Jesus. There is a place for you called the throne of grace, a place for me where we can come and be like Jesus. The throne of grace has two definitions and two different things that it does. Everybody say throne of grace. Number one, it's for the sinner. If you're here today and you do not know Christ, you are identified in the Bible as a sinner. That is not a bad word. That is just a statement of fact. Facts are your friends. When you get on the scale, facts are your friends. Hello. Hello, somebody. Mirrors are your friends. Facts are your friends. Come on, somebody. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. Mirrors and scales and, hey, paychecks. Facts are your friends. They tell you what you really got after you worked all that, that, that time. Don't go in debt. Amen. Facts are your friends. If you don't know Jesus, you are considered a sinner. The throne of grace, Jesus Christ in heaven, welcomes you to come to him to where you can be purified and made a saint. Everybody go to Hebrews 10, 14 with me. If you do not know Jesus, Jesus says, come to me right now, and I'll forgive you and wash you clean. I'll give you a new identity. I will change your life. Jesus is welcoming the whole world to his throne of grace. He says, come on over. I will change you. Hebrews 10, 14 promises us what will happen in every single person's life who comes to the throne of grace. Look at it with me, please. Hebrews 10, what? 14. Here it is highlighted for you. For by one sacrifice, how many times did Jesus have to die? One time. He has made what? Perfect forever those who are being made holy. And as I showed in the second service, I'll show you here, that is actually not the proper tense of that verb. The verb is actually um, in the past tense that we are made holy, and I'll show you here. Of course, I go to the wrong version, but let me just show you one more time. In the New English Translation, says, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are made holy. That is the better tense. And if you don't believe me, you can go up here to verse 10 and see, for by his will we have been made holy through the one offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So if you are a sinner, you can be made holy once and for all. If you don't know Jesus, you can be by his one offering perfected right now for all time. So at this point, are you jacked up or are you perfected for all time? Are you holy or are you dirty? You see, you now make that choice. How much of sin do you still want in your life 
then stay as a sinner and keep enjoying it. The Bible compares this to a pig enjoying its, uh, its pig feed. Has anybody ever been to a pig farm or seen pigs on a farm? My grandpa had some. Have you ever seen the slop that they eat? It's nasty, right? Whatever you don't want at your table, you throw in there. Whatever gets in the garbage that's edible, you throw it in there. They eat it all. They bring their mud to the place where they eat. They'll eat mud with their food. It does not matter to them. This is the example that we get. It's not to be insulting. It's just a truthful way. Sin brings death. Jesus tells us this because he loves us. He's not mocking us. He's not trying to make us feel bad. He's just saying, do you want to be clean? Come to me. If not, this is what you get. So the Christian... Who comes, uh, the sinner who comes to Christ becomes a Christian, not in the sense like he's now a different religion. He doesn't become a Christian because now he has a new set of rules. He becomes a Christian because he's a Christ-like person. That's what Christian means. He is like Christ. As Jesus was, so is he in this world. Jesus now changes the nature of the person. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now, after you are saved, how many saved people do I got in here? Amen. After you are saved, you're no longer a sinner. What are you called in the Bible? You're called a saint. That means a holy person. Look it up. That's always speaking to people who are alive. Saints were never dead people. They were alive people, just like you and I. And now here's what you can do. The place where saints come to receive power not to sin and cleansing if they do. Now go to 1 John 2, chapter 1, verses, uh, 1 John chapter 2, 1 through 2. And get the understanding of how you are to act if you sin as a Christian. But how many would like to have help not to sin before they would sin? Okay, would you really like to choose not to sin if you could? So what do you do? You come to the throne of grace and you ask for help not to sin. How many of you have ever been tempted to sin? Can I see you raise your hand? How many of you then sinned and felt the wage of death or the conviction, the bad, the just you knew you was wrong? Okay. How many of you, once again, thank you for participating. This is awesome today. How many of you were ever tempted to sin, but you stopped and asked God for help not to sin? And how many of you didn't sin then? Okay. Now, is there any sin, any sin for anybody's life that asking God for help will not lead to them living without that sin? In other words, is there any sin that when, when this person comes to Jesus, Jesus is like, oh, my gosh, this is really hard. Angels, I don't know if we can help them on this. I think we got to give them a free pass. Go for it, dude. Go for it. Wink. Just don't tell nobody. Don't tell Pastor Joe. Just go for it. Do you think there's any sin that Jesus is okay with that? Do you think there's any sin that someone can come to Jesus and say, well, I was born this way, and then Jesus goes, well, I understand you're messed up anyway, so go ahead. So those who use that lie for homosexuality, we could use it for murder and say, I was born meant to kill people, right? I was born meant to steal from you. I was born meant to have sex with many women. Sorry, honey. So could we use that same excuse? No, it's a bad excuse, and God doesn't buy it. You may be selling it, but God's not buying it. He doesn't buy the excuse of I'm a sinner. Why? Because he just told you there's a place where sinners come and get changed. He's just told you where there's a place where sinners come and get made holy by a sacrifice that perfects them forever and saves them, delivers them out of their trouble. See, there's a place for sinners to become saints. So now, if you are a Christian, this is the word for you, the saint. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, and we'll put this back into the NIV. I got it up here. He says to, uh, this is John the Apostle, the same one who wrote the book of John, the Gospel of John. He says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not what? Will not sin. So John is saying, hey, guys, I'm writing you this whole book of the Bible here, this whole letter to help you not to sin. So this is the point. We're supposed to learn through Christ who we are and not sin. I'm supposed to learn that when I went to the throne of grace, 1995, that God gave me a new attitude, and so I should have the attitude of Christ in me. Whenever I don't, I should change. I should repent. Repent means to change your mind, to change the way you think. I should get rid of stinking thinking and have the mind of Christ in the matter. I should think the way he thinks about that sin, not the way I think about that sin. I should pray his kingdom to come on earth as it is in, the he as it is in heaven. Is there anybody lusting in heaven right now? So when I pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, I'm saying, God, may I be like they are there. 
And how do I do that? By his power, by his grace. So the throne of grace saves sinners, but the throne of grace for saints empowers saints to live holy. It empowers us to live a different kind of life. But he keeps going. How many are happy for big old butts in the Bible? Amen. My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. So do Christians still get to be forgiven when they sin? Absolutely. And there is no condemnation. If we have sinned as a Christian now and we didn't come to the throne of grace and we didn't get the help that we needed to live like Jesus, we should not beat ourselves up and quit living for God. We should humbly admit our wrong and accept Jesus' forgiveness again. Accept that forgiveness again. It doesn't mean I'm born again again. It just means I had a pure bottle of water I spit in it and it got nasty, but Jesus purified it and made it clean again. Does everybody get it? This bottle of water doesn't go to the sewer flush down the toilet. I don't need to get saved every time I sin. It's just now that I am saved, I need to guard my heart. Guard my heart. I need to hold to faith. I need to walk worthy of the calling. I need to be blameless in my body, soul, and spirit. As the, these are all scriptures. Are you with me? And this is the Christian view of the throne of grace. Two purposes. One, to save sinners. And secondly, to keep saints holy. And if they should sin, to forgive them. How many are happy for the throne of grace? Now, the situation that we have to understand is that in the Old Testament, Jesus fulfilled these things because if he didn't, there would be another kind of throne, another situation with the Father and Son, and this would be called a throne of judgment. So it's the same location, but it has two different roles. So there's still the Father, there's still the Son, but if they didn't offer those sacrifices there, people would die. Curses would come upon the land. And so God, sitting from his throne of grace, would judge the people. Now, do you know that there's a time coming in the book of Revelation where there is a judgment? Can I show you in Revelation chapter 20? Would everybody turn there with me quickly? Turn there with me quickly. Um, Jason, would you come to the piano, please? Revelation chapter 20, there is a throne of judgment. And so it was so important that Jesus did this for us so that we could avoid judgment, the judgment of our soul to death, which would be hell in the lake of fire. He did this so that we would have the throne of grace. But if someone today says, no, I don't want to come to Jesus. I don't want to accept him into my life. Look at what happens. The judgment of the who? The dead. Then I saw a great white throne and those who were seated on it. See, the Bible says now come to the throne of what? The Bible says in Hebrews, let us approach the throne of grace in our times of need. Correct? And we will receive grace and mercy. But that's not happening here. The white throne judgment says the earth and the heavens fled from his presence. There was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were open. Another book was open, which was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades, that's hell, gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had did. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Now watch this, very important. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Where were people thrown who were not found in the book of life? They were flown to the lake of fire. Jesus died to give you an opportunity to be saved so that you could come to the throne of grace. And then he gave us as Christians a way to find help. Help in our temptation. Help in our trials and tests. And that's what God offers for us. He offers us the sacrifice. The priests would give that sacrifice, and that's what Jesus did for us. But not only would the priests offer a sacrifice, he would then give a blessing. And Jesus has given us the greatest of blessing, eternal life, eternity with him. Can you think of a greater blessing? 
But what we must do is hold firmly to our faith. We cannot neglect the commands of God and go on sinning as if that was the purpose. The purpose wasn't for Christians to pretend to be sinners and for sinners to pretend to be saints. It was for a reality of sinners to transform by God's grace into saints and live holy. When we look at Jesus and how He overcomes sin like us, we see that this was amazing because He was in the flesh not doing it as Superman. He wasn't doing it beyond the power that would be given to any man. The Bible says Jesus was baptized. How many of you have been baptized? Jesus then had the Holy Spirit come upon Him. How many have been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Jesus read and quote the scriptures how many of you have the scriptures in your hand right now or available to you how did jesus defeat sin because he was superman from the planet we call heaven no he defeated sin as a man for an example for us a man who followed the word of god when satan tempted him every temptation like turn these bread turn these stones into bread what did jesus say it is written You see, He used the throne of grace by His Father's power. He spoke the Word. In His time of need, He found grace and mercy and He spoke the Word. It's written, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And He did not sin. Are you with me? We want to avoid those kind of errors. And then we want to avoid the error that says, well, only Jesus was perfect, so therefore I'm not perfect. That's not true. I wasn't born perfect. I haven't been perfect. Yes, that part is true. But it's not that I'm not perfect now. The Bible says I have been perfected now. But Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father was perfect. Was he saying dunk like Michael Jordan dunks? How many of you here right now, if the qualification for you getting to heaven was to dunk like Michael Jordan dunks, how many of you could dunk the ball from the free throw line? I want to see whose hand goes up because I'm following you after service today. Well, there's maybe, what, 20, 100 people on the planet that could dunk from the free throw line? Is that what Jesus was saying? Be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. Think about how much harder that would be. That's impossible. You could never do that. So then what is he saying? You can never be like your father? Was he just telling us something that we would never be able to do? Only Jesus would be like his father. That's it, only Jesus. Why does the Bible say be holy for he is holy? You see, because in the sacrifice of Jesus, we are perfected like him. In the sacrifice of Jesus, we are made holy like him. Are you identifying with who you used to be or who you are now in Christ? Stop saying nobody's perfect. Anyone who is in Christ is perfect. Well, what if we make mistakes? We make mistakes and get forgiven, return to our place of perfection. Does perfect mean I always do the right thing? No, does perfect mean I know everything? Get those definitions away from me. All knowing and perfect are not the same thing according to the Bible. When he said be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect, he's not saying be God like your Father is God. He's saying be morally cleansed like your father is morally cleansed. Or be morally pure rather is a better way because fathers never needed to be cleansed. We see that God's throne of uh, of grace offers us forgiveness and the power not to sin. And so we have two options now as we look at this message in closing. It was a part two, so if you didn't get the first part, go back online and watch it. The throne of grace gives us today the option to be forgiven. So let's go. Let's go to the throne of grace. Come on, come with me. Meet me at this altar. Find a prayer worker if you don't know how to pray. And let's overcome sin and live holy. But if you don't, you will face it one day as judgment. Because Jesus then will say, I died for you to change, but you never changed. So you get what you want. Separation from me. All the theologians who have studied out the lake of fire, it's not just the torment of flames, it's separation from God. See, the Bible says the earth is created by God, like we learned today in the offering lesson, stewardship. So everything here is of God, and people don't even realize that as they're trying to run away from God. The air they have is from God. The sanity they have is from God. The love that they have for anybody on this planet came from God. And so what separation from God is separation from sanity, separation from health, separation from love. The lake of fire, the torment, will be more mental than it is anything else. It's you without God and all that God brings to your well-being. Can I close with 30 benefits of the throne of grace? 
Do you know how to give me a little gospel? Show me you know how to do it, baby. Can I get somebody on the drums too? I want to get excited. How many want to leave this mamma jamma excited? Come on, can I get somebody on the drums? There he is. Come on. Yeah, give it up for Vinny. Here he comes. Yeah. yeah. 30 things that will happen in your life when you come to the throne of grace. Number one, you'll get born again. I, I don't need like, like slow jam. I need like, yeah, unless you guys want to switch. Why don't you switch? Can you show him? Just show him. I think he can handle it. Give him one more chance. It'll be awkward if he doesn't. We'll just talk about your Afro puff. Dude, like, why is it I feel like I've seen you in a Mario game? Right? Like, I feel like I've seen you before. Love you. There you go. Number one, you are born again when you come to the throne of grace. Okay, you're switching with him quickly. Go get on the drums. Let's give it up for Jason and Slow Jam. You did good. You did good for Slow Jam. Just, you know what? Follow him on the bass and tickle that bass with him. Just tickle it because I know you'll get it. Come on. Dude, these guys are the most awesomest guys I've ever met in my entire life. Adam is almost as cool as these guys. No, I'm kidding. Adam, you want to come up there with them? You're good? Maybe that's, not why, maybe that's why you're not as cool as them. I don't know. I don't know. Can I put this in your eye? No. <laughs> no, okay, here we go. Are we ready? Are we ready? <laughs> Last week after part one, I went home and wrote this out, and it was so amazing as I started looking at what happens to the believer's life as they come to the throne of grace. Like, it's not just one thing. It's like a zillion things. I wrote out 30. Uh, let me see. I wrote out 30, and I went beyond that, and I kept going, so I forgot to change it to 40. See, I started with 30, and then I just kept going, so it's 40. So i got to change my own title right here. So how many ready for 40 benefits of the throne of grace? Number one, you are born again. You are in made a new creation. You are saved. You become God's masterpiece. You are washed clean from all sin. You're sanctified, justified, redeemed, the righteousness of God, perfected forever, purified from all sin, made holy, given a new spirit, have the laws of God written upon your mind. Woo! Look at this. Your flesh is crucified with Christ. You are given the fruit of the Spirit. You're sealed with Christ. Your soul is saved. Somebody say, my soul. Come on, somebody say, my soul. Somebody say, my soul is saved. Say it's saved. Say it's so saved. Look at your neighbor and say, my soul is so saved. Is so saved. Somebody say, how saved is it? It's so saved. Woo! You are adopted into God's family. You become an heir with Christ. You are seated in heavenly places. You are given all spiritual blessings halfway through. You're given the mind of Christ. You're made more than a conqueror. You are made for good works. You are a saint. You're free from the law of sin and death. You're free from condemnation. You are given eternal life. You are given the peace of God. You receive the blessing of Abraham. Somebody say, I got a new daddy. The blessing of Abraham. Hallelujah. You are forgiven of all sin. You partake in the divine nature. You are engrafted into the vine of Israel. Your life is rooted in Christ. You are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb where there will be the finest of aged wine and the best of meats. Hallelujah. You are blameless. You are God's possession. You have access to the Father in Jesus' name. Somebody say, call him up. Say, Jesus, on the main line. Call him up. You got to tell him what you need. Hallelujah. And it says you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and you have a place prepared for you in heaven. If you believe it, will you stand to your feet? Give God the glory. Come on, give him some praise. Hallelujah. Give him a shout of victory. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Come on.